Welcome everybody. This is the Disposable Web. I am very proud to say that I have brought on board someone that I believe to be uh, extremely knowledgeable in the areas of crowdfunding. And it's extremely pleasurable for me because this is a person that I've actually uh, seen and heard and, and been influenced musically, to be honest. Uh, over the years, I first saw this gentleman 20 years ago, oh back God. in 1995, uh, in a bar in, in Oshawa, Ontario. Uh, he had longer hair back then. Uh, he had a bit less gray hair back then. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he was, uh, uh, you know, maybe a bit less wild or whatnot, but the years have been good to him, and we want to talk a bit about that. So first of all, introduce yourself. I'm Trent. I uh, am in the Headstones. It's a band you may have heard of. <laughs> if you're in Canada and you have not heard uh, of the Headstones, you're definitely doing yourself a disservice. Uh, but more importantly, you know, you, you have toured uh, the better part of, well, I want to say North America, but uh, maybe expand on that. W what's the furthest place you've toured? We went to Mexico and uh, uh, Mexico City and Guadalajara. A couple times and then we went to England once and we played London for some festival there we ended up spending two weeks there and played like three shows or something so we had a lot of free time it was mm -hmm. pretty hilarious but in many ways you are considered a, a Canadian band and, and and you know not to to associate with another band but you you also have a, a pseudo history with the tragically hip as well in terms of evolving from that same era of music would that be a fair statement no he went to school with those guys he went to high school with them and I think university he might have I can't remember but yeah there was definitely always the Kingston connection and our manager is from Kingston, and he grew up with the hip as well, and he was their tour manager for a while. So there's definitely a – actually, we share management now. Oh, very nice. Yeah, we've played with those guys like a dozen times and hung out quite often. Yeah, they're good, cool guys. For those that may not know you, they may have actually seen you uh, without actually knowing it. But I'll be honest, it's pretty hard not to know the Headstones if you've seen them live. Uh -huh. um, you know, we were talking a bit about this prior to uh, uh, the start of the show. In many ways, your music revitalized my, my, my interest in music because uh, it yes. kind of had grown stale. So there is something to be said about <coughs> e even someone, you know, a, a, as old as I being able to, to be introduced to new music, even being ingrained in music so long. The reason we're having this conversation, though, is you were a band uh, from what, 92 to 2003? Is that... The the accurate yeah i mean our first record came out in 93 you and i started writing songs and probably like back in 88 mm. so, so you were together let's say 88 to 2003 the band mm. went their separate ways uh we we can obviously get into some of the specifics but a good part of it is your lead singer became quite uh, uh the uh, the tv movie yeah. uh, type individual so so the the, the, the there, there was a a split for multiple reasons, and I don't necessarily want to get into to the core of it, but feel free to elaborate as you see fit. But the reason we're having this conversation is you actually reformed, uh, what, uh, 2010, 2011? What's the actual... <coughs> 2011, yeah. 2011. And needless to say, the music industry changed a bit. Oh, yeah. Quite, uh, quite between a bit. the days where they would give you $20,000 to go shoot a video in Mexico to... yeah. You know, you want to have an album, come up with the funds yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like there's no money anymore. And like the way it used to be done, they'd give you like upwards to hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to go to a, a studio for like a couple of months that costs like $1,500 a day and record a record that just really isn't done unless you're like a huge megastar now. But so now, and plus nowadays everyone has a computer, they can record studio quality right on this thing right here. Yeah, very much so. And, uh, so we uh, decided to go uh, this, I, did, I had never heard of Pledge Music before and our management came across it and this turned out to be really rewarding uh, experience. Well, we were talking about this earlier as well. A few things also changed during that, 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 that period of absence, if you will, is when you came back on the scene, um, social media was at its peak. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, mobility and, and ease of access, as well as, you know, uh, an entire archive of your music was probably uploaded on various uh, channels and so forth over the years. So when you went, came back and reached out to your fans, what was that initial feeling like? Because you were reaching out to them in a way that you had never really reached out to them before. When the band broke up, there wasn't any YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. And now and there wasn't any. It's funny how much the technology's changed and uh just 10 years 
But uh, so when we came back, when we reformed, we we really embraced all the new technology and loved it. You just on our own, like I, as if we were fans of a band. What would what would we like to do? You know, we want interaction. We want to talk directly to the people. We want exclusive items that are available. You know, to a select few, it makes you feel like you're uh, in the inner circle. You know, things like that. You know, and we've always kept our fan hat on. Like we still are, you know, we're still fans of music. So like, I think it's ridiculous if you stop be- being that just because you're in a band. Mm-hmm. Well, you kind of bring it up. The, the, I think the bands that, that do it the best uh, have retained their fandom of music. You look at someone like a Dave Grohl who will actually still go into the crowd to watch one of his favorite bands live, oh, yeah. you know, surrounded by, you know, yeah. uh, people that. A may not even know he's standing beside them, but yeah. he's he's a fan of music, you know. And I think at the end of the day, when you're a true fan, you have that that other side of the coin where it's like, what what's of value to me? Because I think you said it best. We live in a world now where, for the price of a, a twenty five dollar Rocksmith cable, which you get with a video game, so that not only yeah. will the video game teach you how to play the guitar and the bass, but you can then take that same cable, plug it into your MacBook. And mm-hmm. record, you know, something on GarageBand without even using an amp. Oh yeah, I you used know, like your cost of recording studio is literally a twenty-five dollar cable now. So oh, yeah. when you ask yourself the question, what value am I getting for what I'm paying for? Things have kind of changed in terms of the value equation. Actually, I record on my iPad. I don't even use a cable. I use my acoustic guitar. Yeah. Uh, just my headphones that are like. You know, like ear, earbuds yeah. with a little mic hanging on your on a string. That's what I use. Basically, something it. like this. Yeah, that's my yeah. studio right there. That's kind of my point. Is we now have a cost of production that is near zero, mm-hmm. a cost of distribution which is near zero, an ability to create um, an awareness campaign, a fan base, whatever, through not necessarily the cost of the platforms, but the cost of the energy and time to build. Uh, a following so really at the end of the day the only thing that in my mind a band can do is build that fan base because everything else can be done for dirt cheap you don't need a studio and a recording label or whatnot to do all of those other stuff if you know what i'm kind of getting at did you hear about tom york i did not maybe elaborate on that for me his his latest uh solo record he did it without a record company and he there's no it's only online he, he and he had it available by torrent mm. and i guess just through the promotion of his website and through just a network of radiohead fans he sold something like 4 million copies of it mm-hmm. like it, these things aren't charted this is not a part of uh no record company made any money off it he apparently made something like 20 million dollars off this like this is just a guy basically uploading his solo record from his computer into the internet and then let it go. You know what I mean? Like there was no middleman. He made all the money from it. To your point, even in the, the, the height of the headstones, you know, pre 2003, you were probably making pennies on the record would be my guess. I don't even know what the record deals are like these days. Like there's record companies make money from touring now from your t-shirts. Like back when we were uh, in the, back in the nineties, you would, uh, the split is something, you know, if, if, Close to like 13% of profit, which mm-hmm. is one thing, from your CD sales goes back to the artist. That, per- that 13% of your profit goes back to paying back the record company, the whatever $200,000 they gave you for recording a video, recording a record, touring, and all that stuff. So you're, you pay back at a 13%, you know what I mean? You never pay your stuff back. Apparently, we, we got recouped lately. It's within the past like 10 years, we got recouped in all our records. That's an interesting point because here you are, you know, I, I would consider you to be a successful band by Canadian standards, you know, by mm-hmm. worldwide standards and whatnot. You know, you know, you're not, you're not a, a One Direction or, you no, know, no. Or God, God help you, you're See? not a One Direction. Yeah. But my point being, you're considered to be a successful band and you're now just recouping. Yeah. You know, because to your point, all of that expensive gear, all of that expensive videos, all of that studio time was really a loan more than anything else. Exactly. Oh, yeah. They're not giving you money. They're no. never giving you money. 
So to your point, <laughs> if you were to be given a loan for $20,000 now versus a loan for $20,000 back in 1995, what you could do at $20,000 with, as you say, a laptop, an iPad, a, a web mm. camera, the internet, and so forth, substantially different business model, oh, I yeah. would suspect. Oh, yeah. Like before, the only way to make music would be to go into a $1,500 a day studio. Like that would, that's the only way. Mm-hmm. Now you can, like you said, you know, iPad, garage band. It is a spectacular world. Now, going back to what I was saying earlier, the cost of production, the cost of distribution is pretty much zero. And the reason I call this the disposable web is it's exactly that. We're now in a world where if you have an idea, the cost of actually executing on that idea is so limited or so so little that even if you fail, you can just dispose of it and you really haven't, other than your own personal time, haven't mm-hmm. really lost $20,000 that you got yeah, yeah. back. Definitely. But the missing element, I think, has always been building a community, building a fan base, building people that will actually transact. So to your point, the the uh, the example you gave earlier, it cost him nothing to create, it cost him nothing to upload, it cost him nothing to distribute, but he still needed to have people interested in that music to be able to make that $20 million. That's exactly right. Yeah, we had this Radiohead network, so... <laughs> so in your particular case, you had to convert... A fan base that was 10 years old, meaning they had stopped seeing you live for the right. last 10 years, into a new media, yeah. you know, uh, as well as a new funding model, and not only re-energize that, that fan base, but also grow it to a point where you were able to uh, properly fund. Because, you know, the album still needed to be pressed. The album still needed to be sent to the record stores. You mm. did use a proper studio. I think you used Tim's studio, didn't you? For part of it, yeah. We yeah. also used a, stu- a studio called uh, Noble Street in Toronto. That's the other thing I want to bring up very quickly. During the, the break, you all had regular jobs that you went back to. Oh, yeah. So so there was that... that how do I want to say this? You were a bunch of regular blokes yeah, that had regular much. jobs that didn't have a big-ass budget to be able to, to create their first album, if you will. Yes, oh, no. you had the benefit of a lead singer that had went off into traditional media <clears throat> and built an awareness. So, so I, I don't want to focus too much on you. I, I, honestly, I'd like to focus on the three of you. The, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 because to me, you're more representative of what is needed for someone with an idea to break mm-hmm. through. Right. You know, Hugh was that that. You know, it scaled it up. There's no denying, you know, that there's oh, yeah. a hockey stick when you, you yeah. introduce the, the traditional media that Hugh brought. But yeah. the rest of it was all you. Yeah. So give me your thoughts on when you first got approached with Pledge Music in this particular case, as well as social media. How did you go about reinvigorating that, that fan base that had been isolated, if you will, from the band for 10 years? When we first got back together and did our reunion shows, we recorded one song. And we uploaded it for like you know for free up onto our website. Didn't we weren't charging anything for it, and just uh, sort of started to get a little more interest happening that way. Our Facebook page had something like only eighteen hundred likes or something like that at that point. So then we released the song, and we were like got up to two thousand. We kept seeing it grow, and now it's up to like twelve thousand, I think. And that's just in a couple of years. And our, I think our fan base had to grow, go, grow along with the idea of this new, of the new social media, and now they're completely embracing it. And our old fans from like twenty years ago, they're just as involved, if not more, than the younger fans that are latching on now. Like it was cool to go out and play again, and having twenty-year-olds out there come to see us. It's like, wow, you weren't even born last time we were here. <laughs> I think that's kind of uh, the benefit as well as, as we kind of talked about this, having that break in between. Not only did the fan base become younger, but you as a band were, were rejuvenated to a certain degree as well, because you kind of said it best. You went from a, a, a touring schedule where you would be isolated from your fans the second you got off the stage, oh, yeah. you know, to a point where you could continue that conversation in the six hours that you were on uh, uh, on the bus to the next city or in yep. the hotel room or whatnot. So there's something to be said, I guess, that for the success of the new albums to have occurred, you needed to increase that fan base 
and a good part of it was conversations, right? And, and for the most part, and I know you were saying it was mostly Hugh and you, and that sounded off, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, you did quite a bit of the interaction yourself, whether or not it was Facebook, Twitter. I think you were also doing some Instagram stuff near the end, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your general thoughts on, before we get into the crowdfunding, if you were a new band coming on board, what would be some of those helpful hints or, or tips or, or lessons learned, if you will, for, for a band of, you know, let's call it three guys that wanted to get together and create an album on, on, an, al- on an iPad or whatnot. How would you engage with that fan base? You just got to keep it up. You have to just not let up and just, you know, you just have, just have to keep the dialogue going. The only thing that I really noticed that we did is we didn't stop. We didn't give up. And not like it was an effort to keep going. It was just we were enjoying it. So you get those, you know, two or three people that are responding. Like you feel like you're talking to maybe a small handful of people, but there might be like hundreds that are just that are watching and not, you know, engaging firsthand. And you got to remember that all the time. Lots of people like to lurk, you know. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not really one for getting in there online. I like to just read what people are saying a lot of the time. And you just got so that means so that you just got to keep the content spewing out mm-hmm. well they, they quite often say that that the ratio is something like a 99 one 90 percent are the lurkers nine percent are the ones that will engage but it's that one percent at the end of the day that are going to be the heavy responders the heavy contributors and, and more importantly the ones that will actually be creating the content those would be the ones that are uploading videos of the show you know exactly. and, and so forth oh yeah and we've gotten to know those people quite well over the last couple of years they uh it's great it's, it's cool because we get uh meet people and get to know them a lot more than we used to. Like we, we, we made friends over the years, but in the last two years, we've, I probably know like a few dozen people by name when I see them at shows or whatever. Mm -hmm. Your your thoughts on, because I, I, I've always believed this, that quality aside, because I know that as a musician, quality is important to you. Is there something to be said about, um, some of those live shows, whether or not they're the five, you know, second clips or the thirty second clips or the the full songs, did that help or hinder uh, getting the word out? You know, the the, the fan base videos, for the lack of a better statement. Yeah, those things are kind of hard to live with a little bit because it's not it's never a perfect representation of mm-hmm. uh, it's not a controlled uh, representation of what we're doing. Like the sounds never that good, yeah. you know. When you when you release your own video, you, you control how it looks, how it sounds, how it comes across and when somebody's holding a cell phone in a in a you know a bar you know like who knows what it's going to turn out to be but well, in, in most cases it's overdriven and it's shaky and yeah, as yeah. you say the it's 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 not to standard for lack of a better statement yeah yeah it's like what we're, we were saying earlier just throw enough shit out there and Something stuff sticks <laughs> well i think that's kind of what i was getting at too is is you know, when you think of it just purely from an SEO point of view, you know, search engine optimization, the more content that's on YouTube, all of that all of a sudden boosts the the overall Headstone brand name, right? right? So even if people aren't actually seeing it, the very nature of the fact that there's a lot of content out there, uh, more importantly, content that you're not the bottleneck in creating. Because I right. think that's the other thing, too, that, that quite often people struggle with because you said it best you just got to be consistently getting stuff out there and there comes a time when let's be honest you're busy yeah you know so there's i guess in my mind something to be said about that one percent that that is really engaged with you sharing the load of that content and to your point it may not be to the spec that you would create Mm -hmm. uh, but i think it does you know make it easier for you to be able to sustain that mass amount of content i think what also um, is important that I'm thinking now is mm-hmm. like when you are creating the content that when you're interacting with the people, I see a lot of bands put out whatever they're saying and it sounds really cold. It sounds corporate. It sounds like a group think kind of attitude, you know, here, like Hugh gets on and types and it's all capitalized. Or whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's not perfect punctuation or anything. It's just, he'll just go out there and spew it all out there on the keyboard when we write our press releases, so like the first one we did for for the one in the chamber music, I wrote it, and so it's directly from us. It's not, you know, okay, this it's not going through the management or the let's hire a press person and to write a statement. Let's, uh, you know, what is the band saying, and it should just be exactly 
straight from our heads to the people. Mm -hmm. And I think like we speak honestly and we speak directly. I think that's uh, really important because then the people feel like they're talking to real people. That's the other difference that I found between, if you will, the, um, you know, the 90s uh, way of doing music versus the 2000 way of doing music is, I'll be honest, that there's no excuse to not have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Well, look at what we're doing right now. You know, yeah. it, it, there's no long distance fees or anything like that. Yes. But there needs to be the desire to have the conversation. And if the band or a member of the band or, or a spokesperson of the band, depending, you know, it could be the roadie type of thing, decides to be that voice, it's got to be the voice of the band, not the voice of the office. Exactly. Because Lord right. knows we know the difference by now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so you got together. You decided to do the album. You 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 proved that you had a fan base that that could generate uh, you know a certain degree of awareness. But you needed to monetize that fan base, and I, mm -hmm. I I hate to say monetize in the sense that you're you're always monetizing your fan base, whether or not it's concerts, T-shirts, album oh, sales, yeah. or whatnot. Yeah. But in this particular case, you were pre-monetizing it. Yeah, that's like the that's the way I like to look at it. Is People are just buying the record before it's, before it's released instead of after it's released. Mm -hmm. So why not give them a chance to be involved in the creation as well and have get sneak peeks at the recording process, actually come to the studio and watch us record, even be involved. We actually had people you know, doing hand claps and doing shouts or whatever. Uh, my God, I couldn't imagine going to see my favorite band in the studio and being involved in their creative process that would blow my mind. You said it best is you broke down that that curtain, if you will, or, or that that barrier yeah. where, you know, when you're on stage, there there is a very clear barrier between you and, and, and oh, the yeah. people in, in, in digesting your music. Uh, and if you break that barrier, the roadies and security are all over you type of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so to, to be one of the few, as you say, that inner circle that got to uh, spend a bit more for the album, but get the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I genuinely believe that we, we've stopped buying products and services a very long time ago. We're now buying experiences. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, uh, people will quite often say, you can have two albums that look identical, but if you know this artist and you truly love this artist, you'll pay 10000 20000 more than the mm -hmm. exact same product because it's the association but if you're now also part of the creation process mm -hmm. um that now i think becomes forty thousand fifty thousand sixty thousand like it's a scaled because For it's sure, the experience could, yeah. if you know what i'm getting at. it's not oh, yeah. just the i'm buying this album because it's got this uh, person singing on it or playing the guitar or whatnot when you gave that experience to this new group of people I, there's the other benefit as well as they now started talking about that because they yeah. were on social media as well. So right. it's not just you saying, this is we're creating a new album. You had all these people saying, we're here and they're creating the new album. What was that immediate feedback like for you? It was great. It was uh, really what kind of an unexpected benefit to having people, like for example, come to the studio and hear tracks before they're finished, is that it actually kept us excited like you might get, we might get a little frustrated with how a song is going or how we might be in disagreement with each other in the band. Like, Oh, I, you know, with directions that songs are going. And then you have like 20 people sitting in the studio and they hear the song and they all go, Oh, I really like how that's ha what's happening there. And then we kind of, it makes it clearer for us as to what we're doing well, and it keeps the excitement going. Well, there's something to be said, and I'll be honest, I, I do a lot of video editing, so I'll spend hours on a pixel. Is it this way yeah. or is it this way? And, you know, same thing uh, when I do uh, audio recordings, you know, and you've got all the tracks laid out and you're whatnot, and you, you know, especially with something like GarageBand, where it's like you could literally take a, a digital track and turn it into anything in post-production. When do you stop? You know, yeah, yeah. when, when, well, when do you stop? Cool. And sometimes <laughs> it takes someone else to come by and say, and I'm not saying this in a bad way, but it's good enough. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Exactly, and yeah. let's be honest: in some cases, good enough is great for the average person, if you know oh, what I mean. Yeah, but yeah. having that that freedom of exp of expression, because to your point, back in the studio days, you know, where, where someone was paying big bills, you were in the door, out the door. Every second you were in there was costing you money. Yeah. Now, when you're in, let's say your your basement studio, and you're just with a bunch of guys. 
it's not costing it. There's not necessarily that same rush to complete it, if you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I want to take it one step further. You've got the fans in the, the uh, uh, in the studio. They're now engaging, but there was also other aspects of it, uh, the the perks and whatnot. Right? Who came up with the perks? Was it you? Was it the the, the band? Yeah, was it... we all did. Everybody did. Everybody. When we first the idea first came up, they're like, "Send us ideas for what you think we should do." And uh, like uh, Hugh had artwork for sale, and, you know that he had done. You know, maybe if some fan wants to own a piece of Hugh Dillon artwork and mm. they bought it up right away. While we were in the studio, I actually did doodles of all the of the guys in the band and uh, then Hugh did one of me. We put that together, put it up on the pledge thing. People bought that. It was, so it was kind of cool that the, uh, you, we thought of, I can't remember all the things, but mostly it was sort of uh, the, what you would expect, like a signed t-shirt, a signed uh, CD, a drumstick, a drum head. Uh, we actually had um, private bass and guitar lessons and drum lessons so that people would uh, come and hang out with us in the studio and jam with us. Yeah, it was kind of a variety of anything you could think of, really. Mm -hmm. And then the, the one thing that led to the one in the chamber music was a private acoustic concert for, I think it was 20 people, and it cost, I think, $5,000 for during the Love and Fury um, campaign. Mm -hmm. And then we had that concert for the 20 people in our studio and uh, it turned out to be a really fun experience. Like we had never really done anything like that, that small, that intimate. And then we're like, Hey, this could be a record, you know, doing our old songs acoustically. And that's what happened with one in the chamber. Funny you bring that up because that was the, the, the natural segment way to, to what I wanted to bring up. Now you went not just from uh, a crowdfunding, but also to a certain degree crowdsourcing. You know, oh, yeah. Now all of a sudden, you know, uh, the band, um, uh, and the fans were were collaboratively uh, coming together on a concept for the next album, which, as you say, was the all acoustic. Did the did the fans also have a sense of what songs would get uh, picked for that album? Or no, we kept that pretty uh, tight lipped, actually, and uh, we ended up, I think, tracking over twenty songs, and we had to go with what kept us interested because we're playing songs that are. 20, 25 years old, maybe. We had to keep ourselves interested. If you're playing old songs, we got to like reinvent them. And we wanted to not, it, we didn't want it to be like when we did the uh, acoustic show, it was a traditional unplugged show where we just basically played the same arrangement just with acoustic guitars. You know, the same song played the exact same way, although we're not plugged in. Right, right, right. When we decided to do the recording. We're like, well, let's not just do that. Let's rethink the song entirely and even change chords change the feel change the melody a tiny bit whatever like just try and like as if we were writing the song today how would we do it well you also use some some very uh, interesting uh, instruments as well uh, that was a mandolin no was it, yeah, yeah you know so so you you definitely get a, a different vibe because to me, one of the things, and I remember reading this online somewhere, it's like people are either going to love that album or hate that album. Yeah. Um, and honestly, you know, there's a larger middle ground in there. But to me, when I think of the Headstones, I always think of it as a very high energy band, exactly, especially yeah. live. Like you guys live, I'm dumbfounded every time I see you guys live. Awesome. The, the energy on that stage is is, is great. And, and more importantly, I, I love the fact that the camaraderie, camaraderie I can't say the word properly, yeah. has come back as well. But when you think of an acoustic, how do you get that same level of energy into an acoustic album? Well, that's, yeah, that's a, a thing that's always been a, a, the other side of the coin for, the, for us as a, as a band is we really enjoy the acoustic songs. We like to listen to, like I grew up, when I grew up, I listened to lots of Simon and Garfunkel mm -hmm. and my dad was a big folk music fan and so I, I, I heard that stuff growing up. The other guys did as well. We have always, when we were writing, so when we were actually writing a song, it usually starts out just sitting with an acoustic guitar. Like the whole first record I think was written on acoustic guitar. So it was not when you're it from within the band, it's not really a stretch at all. Mm. It's just, <laughs> it's just not us on stage, mm. which is a whole other animal. Once we get up there, I haven't seen you guys tour on the latest uh, 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 tour for that that album. So I got to ask, uh, when you're now on stage, how many of those songs are you now doing acoustically as part of your live set? Kind of still debating that whole idea. We did a 
an exclusive uh, pledge music only concert at the Horseshoe in Toronto, mm -hmm. which only holds like 300 people. When we did a uh, like about a seven song acoustic set, and we did our regular rock show, and then we played acoustic afterwards, sort of like as a, a bonus sort of encore -y type thing. Mm -hmm. But we're not sure about how much acoustic we're going to incorporate into a. Uh, your usual rock show like we enjoy to go out and just blow people's heads off and uh <laughs> that's what you know is fun so i mentioned the high energy and unless you've seen tim at the beginning of a set and at the end of a set <laughs> you, you really don't have an appreciation for for how much energy is spent oh, because yeah. the guy's a wet sopping mess he at, is. At, at the end of, of a set and i'll be honest i i grew up you know with, with the cliff burns and and, and whatnot uh watching tim play bass on stage is quite quite fun to watch to be honest and oh, you yeah. all you all have your your, your places clearly on, on stage and that's you know 30 odd years worth of, of, of stage craftsmanship but th I, I've always struggled with the idea of what would an acoustic set be so to me when I, I listen to that album I, I love it for what it is and it's actually quite a, a good album to listen to while I'm working because it's not as you know, you you put on like it's over, you know, or whatever. It's hard not to get the heart pumping or whatnot. Yeah, and sometimes yeah, yeah. that's not what you need, if you know what yeah. I mean. You need to. Yeah, people kinda... tell me it's good workout music. It is an amazing workout <laughs> music. I, I would agree with that statement. 